We've designed an open source UPS that redefines the relationship customers have with their electronics. It uses 12 18650 upgradable batteries, an ESP32 to host a web server, RP2040 for general control, GPIO to wire in external components, relays, and more. Let's get into it. A UPS, or uninterruptible power supply, is a device that will maintain power to your system even during a power outage. Your system might be a computer, router, or other important infrastructure. Our device has all the features of a standard UPS with some interesting additions. This video will serve to outline our features and show you how I did it. I'm going to go through the schematic and go over some of the more interesting elements of it. There's some pretty unique parts to this and some things that were done in some non-conventional ways for some reasons that I'll get into later. It's a 12 volt in, 12 volt out device. So the input is a 5.5 millimeter barrel jack with a different inner diameter than the, the output jack so the user doesn't switch them up. You don't want anything from the output jack to be fed back to the input jack. So let's say the say you have a wall adapter and that's plugged into the input and then you have a device that's connected to the output. You don't want any if you unplug the wall adapter from the wall inside, you don't want current to be able to flow from my provided 12 volts from the UPS back into the electronics of that wall adapter. So this is effectively just a diode. So it will let current, under normal condition you have power, it'll let current flow directly from V in to V out. But in the event that this voltage goes away, it won't let current flow from V out to V in. So when I say this is effectively a diode, it's an ideal diode controller with a MOSFET. So this is a high side FET and this part will effectively turn that FET on or off. You can get the same effect with a diode. The problem is a diode typically has like a 0.7 volts voltage drop over the part. And with 0.7 volts, this is a 9 amp device. It can provide 9 amps to the output. Six or seven watts of power dissipation in the diode. So that's obviously not 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 ideal so as far as replacing basically a diode with an ideal diode i have the data sheet up for this fet right now rds on so this is the resistance of the fet when it's turned on from the drain to the source so 2.5 milliohms so we've gone from like a 7 watt power dissipation if we were to use a diode to like 2.5 milliohms times like say That's 25 milliwatts, which is obviously a lot more acceptable and a lot more ideal for this device. Anyway, so this is the ideal diode. What I thought was interesting and the interesting part of this device is the actual power path. So it's quite a unique power path. Like a lot of people, if they were building something like this, they would take a PMEC, which in a lot of cases is the best way to do it. But what I, what I opted for was to do something like totally off the cusp. And it was to do with cost savings and user programmability. So the output of this device isn't just 12 volts out. It can go from 0 to 12 volts. So basically, if you were to use a PMIC, typically your voltage output would be set by a resistor. So you could either replace that with a digital potentiometer and then control that with a microcontroller or some PMICs have an input pin where you can maybe put an analog voltage to control the output voltage. What I've done is I've actually chosen this CSD97395 Q synchronous buck next FET power stage. So this is effectively combining two end channel FETs in a half H bridge uh, configuration and putting a gate driver in it as well. So the input to turn the FETs on and off is like TTL logic level. And then since the gates are like backed, or the gate drivers are backed right up against the gates, 
like this thing is super crazy. Like it's a microscopic little part. So it's like 3.5 millimeters by like 4.4 millimeters. And it can do 15 amps and they're claiming a 92% system efficiency at 15 amps with a max rated continuous current of 25 amps and a peak of 60 amps. Like this is a crazy part configuration before I actually get through. So this does a kind of half decent way of describing what we got here. So there's two FETs. This is the half H bridge and then you have a pin connecting the two. The in and they call it like key ground. And then they have these, these are the PWM inputs and some other logic inputs that you can use to control the part. Here's the output, my output voltage. And this is connected to the top of the battery stack. During a discharge mode, where there's no power being applied to the input, this is going to be a synchronous buck supply. So say, say you had like 20 volts at VBAT. If you PWM this at 50%, you're gonna get 10 volts of the output. So 50% duty cycle on here, 10 volts of the output. Now where it starts to get interesting is how this can also work in a synchronous boost mode. So that's mode one, discharging. Mode two is charging and normal operation. If you effectively put 12 volts here, so you're powering the device from the wall, you can modify the duty cycle of this part and this can actually push your VBAT, VBAT voltage up and charge the cell stack like that. So this, and what's driving the PWM of this part? It's being driven by the RP2040, yeah, the microcontroller. So what I've done is with this part and a microcontroller, I've created a synchronous buck, synchronous boost, battery charger, gas gauge, and protection circuitry. Current sampling is done through current sampling resistors. So these little five milli R, milli ohm. And then this is also a nice little part. Low and high side voltage output current sense amplifiers. So this part is literally designed to take a differential voltage, a very small differential voltage, and amplify this to be read into the ADC of a microcontroller or another ADC. So this is conditioned such that when this voltage goes above this regulator's, or sorry, references voltage, current will start flowing here. This will go to zero volts. And then it will do things like inhibit this PWM buffer right here. So basically this device will get turned off if battery is over current, load is over current, and, or battery is over voltage. So now I'd like to take a look at the battery bank. Lithium ion cells can be pretty finicky. Um, if you overcharge them, they'll blow up. If you overcurrent them, they'll blow up. If you over temperature them, they'll blow up. So I chose a BQ76920P. So this is a multi cell stack battery manager. There's four series cells and each cell has three parallel cells. So this will be able to detect for an over discharge event, a short circuit event, and will also be able to balance the cells as well. So if one cell is at like 4.2 and one is at like 4.0, it will drain down the 4.2 volt cell so that they all, you don't get any cells that go over their 4.2 maximum voltage. There's two low side FETs here, back to back FETs. So those essentially cut out the entire ground of the system. There is a host micro or a companion microcontroller for the for the battery manager. Um, it's an STM 32G0, so it's a low cost part. And this effectively talks to it over I2C and sets up all the registers. This microcontroller can talk to the main RP2040 via an opto isolated UART bus as well. Finally, I'm gonna get into the two microcontrollers in the system. The SP32 is pretty straightforward. It's connected to the two relays here. It's connected to the CH340C, which is just a USB to serial converter. So you can flash through the USB port and everything else is pretty standard. The RP2040 is connected to USB as well. So it uses a USB-C 
connector, which goes into this FS USB 42 MOX, which is eff effectively a USB multiplexer. So this, this decides if the USB you plug into the board is either connected to the RP2040 or the ESP32 for flashing. That's configurable via a jumper. Okay, that is it for this device. If you're interested in what we are doing here, there are two ways that you can reach out. So the first is if you wanna receive updates, there is a email spot in the link below to protect Lee's website. They were a collaborator on this video. So you can re receive updates that way. If you're interested in giving input, there is a link to a Discord server where we talk about open source hardware and projects like this. Thirdly, you can just send me an email. I guess I'll just put it up there and you can just like type it in old school if you don't use Discord. Awesome, thank you for watching. Let's keep building open source stuff and keeping it going. If you like the channel, like and subscribe and talk to you later, ciao.